Somebody say hidden in plain sight. You say, what in the world does that mean? Well, I'm going to tell you. I uh, don't know how many weeks it'll take to tell you, but I'm going to tell you. Amen. I'll tell you what, for those who may not have had anybody be nice to them since we've been here, turn to your neighbor on both sides and say, I just want to tell you good morning. Just tell her, I just want to tell you, uh-huh. <laughs> we had a powerful service uh, this morning. Greatly attended. It was, yeah, much, much larger than a normal nine o'clock crowd. And um, I'm starting something new. I need you, uh, for those, those of you who may not have been here long or you may be visiting this morning, I, uh, I love to preach. I'm an, I'm an intense guy. But um, what I'm getting ready to start preaching on, it's, it needs me to just kind of take a moment and, and lay the groundwork for it. <clears throat> because it's a very unusual topic in this day and time. And uh, if, if it's not explained properly, it just kind of can wig people out. So Terrence, just play with me a minute. Let me lay some groundwork. We have a, a church culture in America that shuns the supernatural. Um, we don't have worship services, we have song services. And they sing two or three songs in 15 minutes and they don't want anything to happen. One of the foremost pastors in America, and if I called the name, everybody's heard of this person. I looked at him, I said, what you going to do when the Holy Ghost invades your church? He looked back at me and said, that'll never happen. That's a quote. I think, I can't Google and find this, but I think there was a lot of mess and chaos in my generation coming up and in my father's and grandfather's generation, and all of it was blamed on the Holy Ghost. And so when they saw this chaos and foolishness, they're like, you know what? I don't want that. I don't want church to be weird. But we never correct things. We always swing the pendulum too far the other way. And so now it's systems and t-shirts and lights and sound systems and smoke and, you know, get your koozie as you walk out the door. And it's, it's clouds with no water. It's a form of godliness with no power, which the Bible warned would be the main struggle of the end time church. It looks like church, smells like church, acts like church, feels like church, but everybody leaves the way they came. There's no change there. And if there's not power to change, then what are we doing? This is all a sham. Let's shut it down and go do something else. I get up every day believing things can change. And people can, I've changed. This message that changes me can change anybody. And I've been very concerned because while the, wherever the pulpit is silent, the people struggle. And so we talk about relationships, and so we talk about success, and we talk about goal setting, and we talk about plan, we talk about purpose, we talk about all these things that are just hot topics, especially with the millennials and the Z generation. But there's no mention that there are two epic battles going on right above your head between good and evil. There are two kingdoms in conflict, not just in this room, but in your heart. You got somebody that hates you when you wake up every day. And for every assignment God's given you, there's an assignment against that assignment. But nobody talks about it because we don't want to be weird. And because we don't want to be weird, now we're trying to therapy and medicate everything. Because we don't acknowledge the demonic. We don't acknowledge iniquities in the bloodline. We don't acknowledge curses. We don't even talk about them. Now, Hollywood loves it. But it's not biblically based. It's, it seems like to me right now, about seven out of every 10 movies coming out is about the supernatural. So the church will not teach people on the supernatural, so the only place they have to learn is the internet and movies. And let me tell you something about demons and devils. They don't ever show up looking like demons. Demons don't show up with red skin, horns on their head, beady eyes, and a fork tail. 
The Bible says they masquerade as angels of light. So you got to understand, evil always shows up looking good. Usually evil shows up in a person. Yep. Oh, don't worry, it's going to get quieter than this before I get through. (laughs) Can I tell you something? Whenever God wants to bless you, usually he sends a person. Whenever the enemy wants to curse you, he normally sends a... If you read the Bible, whenever they're addressing things, they're not addressing what, they're addressing who. And who shall separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It's never a what, it's always a who. I have noticed in my own life, when the right people enter my life, right things start happening. When the wrong people exit my life, wrong things quit happening. So I've come to people today who are dealing with things and you don't know why. That's why I'm preaching this series. You're swinging at stuff and you don't even know what you're swinging at. And your life feels like it's on a bungee cord and you fight and scratch with everything in you to gain one inch, but there's a bungee cord that jerks you back a mile every time. And some people under the sound of my voice doing things that are destructive and you don't even like what you're doing but can't find the power to stop. There's a reason for all that. And I came to expose the darkness today. (laughs) Because your enemy, once you know who he is, is not nearly as lethal. When he's invisible, man, he's lethal. That sniper back up there, you can't see him with the camera. He's lethal. But once he's exposed, he's much less dangerous. I can't win these battles for you, but I can expose them. I can expose them. And so I don't want you to be wigged out at a pastor that's finally going to get up here and really talk him and pull back the veil on this spiritual realm that is working and many times working against us and we don't even know what to fight. We got a generation that is being medicated and dumbed down 10 times more than any other generation. Why? You can't medicate a demon. Well, we go to therapy. And I believe in medication. I believe in therapists. Don't don't get me wrong. Don't twist that. But you can't counsel a demon. When the demonic is involved, it has to be cast out and it has to be broken. That's why Jesus said... When you cast out devils, the kingdom of God has come upon you. He says, when you move one kingdom out and bring another kingdom in, he said, that's when you know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. Oh, these scriptures are all in there. (laughs) And so today, today, I want you to start this journey with me. And most of these messages are going to end with a chance for people to respond and see. Probably two-thirds of the entire sanctuary got up and surrounded these altars in the last service. And I didn't even really coerce it. Just as soon as I opened it up, they just, I'm almost, some of them almost running because I'm gonna reveal some of the, my own things that I've had to deal with and maybe that'll open up some places in your heart and mind where you can say, you know what, that sounds like me. So Holy Spirit, I ask, I ask you to open the hearts of the hearer and give me supernatural power to communicate this. I don't wanna confuse anybody. So I ask you to just really use me, God, and 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 Make it plain today and give me a supernatural gift to communicate this message. That's what I ask of you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Tell your neighbor, say, here we go, neighbor, here we go. I have a mentor that's been in my life about 20 years. I don't want to call his name because most of you would know him and his name evokes a lot of different opinions. But I love him. He's been good to me. And he looked at me one time when some things were going really wrong in my life. And he said, Ron, he says, you can have a $500,000 Rolls Royce. He said, but if the tire's flat, you can't drive it. Now that's not deep, is it? It's very profound. Because the fact is you can be doing a lot of things right, but you can be getting one or two things wrong and life won't move. I just choose to believe that most of the people under the sound of my voice are getting most things right. 
But I think we would all probably nod our head that we're open to the fact that we might be getting a couple of things wrong. <laughs> if not, I probably need to sit down and let you have the mic and just preach. <laughs> Certainly the one holding the mic would admit that to you. And uh, I've noticed for years, I wrote a book in 2010, The Necessity of an Enemy. I think I kind of need to do a relaunch because I've it would, the, 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 my world was so much smaller then. And um, the whole thing was to expose, what, what are you fighting for? What am I fighting? And what am I fighting for? Because when people just get up every day and fight, that's not any way to live. But if you can show me the spoils of victory, and I can see the other side, then that gives me the fuel to keep swinging. But when I don't know what I'm fighting and I don't know who I'm fighting, then my heart grows faint and that's just when you get paralyzed in life and your life will not move. I'm gonna start off in Deuteronomy 28, which is the blessings and cursings chapter. It is a very long chapter. It is the chapter where the children of Israel are still getting to know their God. They don't know him. They've been in captivity 450 years, twice as long as this nation has existed. They have been in captivity. They do not know the God of their father Abraham. So Moses is having to reintroduce them to God. This is what he likes. This is what he don't like. This is how he is. This is how he operates. This is how he thinks. These are his standards. They're having to get to know their God. So now that has taken place. It started with the Ten Commandments, a moral code. And now Moses is in his last days, and now he's filling in the details. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey, diligently obey, if you, if you, if you. God is a if you, then I'll God. If you, then I'll. If you, then I'll. Heaven responds to earth. Earth don't respond to heaven. You bind it on earth, it'll be bound in heaven. Loose it on earth, be loose in heaven. Agree to it on earth, it'll be done by your father. And he says, if you, here, I'll do this here. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully, not casually, carefully. Di look at the words, diligent and careful. Diligent and careful to observe all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth. He says, if you will diligently look and carefully obey the things which I'm telling you, he said, you will live a life at such a high standard, it will cause all people to grow jealous of you. <clears throat> and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Why? Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now let's read some of them. I can't read them all. This is a very long chapter. I just want to read enough for you to get the gist. Blessed shall ye be in the city. I can't hardly read this without shouting, by the way. Blessed shall ye be in the country. Verse 4. Blessed shall ye be the fruit of your body. That means your children. And that means your grandchildren will walk in blessing. To the produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. That means your economy. Yes, God said, I will bless your money. I will bless that too. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Verse 6. Blessed shall ye be when you come in. Blessed shall ye be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies to rise up against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way, but they will flee and run away from you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ways. So they'll come in one door, but they'll be so afraid of you, they'll run through seven to get out. The Lord will command the blessing on you and your storehouses and in all which you have set your hand. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And this is just a few out of about 15 to 20 verses where God says, bless shall you be. Now, the blessing is a state of being. Amen. Stay with me. Okay, we're going to shout some today, but I got to make sure we understand this. The blessing is built into the system. There are laws at work in the earth that God has put in place and they have their built-in reward 
and they're built in discipline. God is not standing up in heaven cursing me. Because wrong concepts of God has destroyed people. But God has designed a system. And when you flow with that system, blessing follows you. Surely, David said, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. He said, good things and mercy shall follow me everywhere I go, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the kind of life I want to live. <laughs> okay? So, and reprimand and com consequence is built in the disobedience. That's why I refuse to pastor a church where we are casual about God. Because what you ignore and what you rebel against, it has consequences. It don't matter. Let me tell you something. You say, well, I don't believe in these hidden laws that you can't see. Well, you're, you're experiencing one right now. The only way you hear my voice is from sound waves. If there weren't sound waves in this room, it wouldn't matter how many speakers I had. But you can't see them. But you're experiencing them right now. Okay? You say, well, I don't like gravity. Well, that's good. Go see if gravity cares. Jump off this roof. <laughs> you can't see gravity, but you jump off the roof and it breaks both your legs. <laughs> Why? Because you didn't flow with it, you flowed against it. <laughs> How does a plane rise? Unseen laws called the law of lift. That's what grace is. Sin is the law of gravity. Grace is the law of lift. It, it's a higher law. It lets you defy gravity. I can't go there. You can't see any of these things. You can't see what's going over that wing. You just see the plane lifting. We are operating in laws we can't see every day when you pull up your cell phone on the way home. You're operating in laws and physics you can't see. The kingdom is a world you can't see, but it's laws that cannot be ignored. Because blessings follow those who flow with them. Consequences follow those who ignore them. Are we all right so far? Some of you look like you're scared at what I'm going to say. Just hang on. I'm, I'm on your side. I come in peace in Jesus' name, I promise. This is not supposed to be doom. It's supposed to be liberating. You can't beat your enemy till he's exposed. We got to see what we're fighting here. Okay? Now, let's keep on going to the next verses in this. All right, this is the not so good side. But... It shall come to pass if you do not <laughs> obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of the commandments and his statutes which I command you this day that all of the curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall you be in the basket in your kneading bowl. Cursed shall the fruit of your, your, your kids. If you ignore God, it will affect your offspring. Why? Because these blessings are transitory to the next generation, but there are something called generational curses that are transitory to the next generation. You didn't just get your brown eyes from your daddy. You got some other stuff from your daddy. There's some other stuff that came through the bloodline. Why do you think when you go to the doctor, the first thing they start doing is asking you about your family? Yep. Has anybody had heart disease on your mother's side? Has anybody had heart disease? Why? Because even they know what you're dealing with probably got to you through the blood. Because the life of a thing is in the blood. Oh, Leviticus 26, the life of a thing is in the blood. Whatever lives, lives in the blood. Okay, And the Bible says that what travels in the bloodline, which is called iniquity, that's another message, can go four generations deep, <laughs> which means somebody that I didn't even know could have started something and I'm out here swinging at the air today and don't even know what I'm fighting. Curse shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your land, so your economy is affected. I know people that work day and night and are brilliant people and cannot get ahead. They cannot get ahead. I know people that were great parents and their kids are crazy. I had some of that myself. And I looked in my home and I said, wait a minute, I was a good dad. I was a present dad. 
I prayed with my kids. I taught my kids this. I taught my kids and then saw things happening saying, where did this come from? Not understanding that there can be curses that I'm fighting that came from somebody I don't even know. <laughs> Cursed shall you be when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. I'll stop right there because this again is a long chapter and I may come back and pull some of these out because they talk about how each individual part of your life can be affected by these blessings and by this curse. Some of you come from families that didn't honor God and all they passed you was trouble. And you don't even know what it is to be passed a blessing. God intended for us to bless the generations that come from our loins. God did not want us to curse them with a greater curse than we lived in ourselves. Can I tell you something? What you're struggling with publicly, probably your dad or granddad struggle with privately. And what's out in the street now and your in the previous generation was in the closet. Sooner or later, you will deal with your daddy's devil. Y'all looking at me like an ice cream you can't eat. Are we all right? Can you go with me on this journey? I'm telling you now, I'm going here. I'm going. <laughs> okay. If you, if you don't want to be free, you're in the wrong place. If you want freedom, we're going to do what she said. We're going to make it plain. Amen. So now it's a state of being. It's not something God's doing. Bless shall ye be. Curse shall ye be. In other words, it's following you. Curses are progressive. Okay. They will come up on you, they will pursue you, then they overtake you. In other words, they confront you, then they won't quit t chasing you, they pursue you, until finally they've tried to destroy you. So they're progressive in nature. And by the way, I'm reading this straight out of the Bible. Blessings are the same way. Do you know that word overtake you means literally in the Hebrew, tackle you in the street. I want blessings to come upon me and to chase me and to tackle me down in the street and tickle me till I can't take it no more. <clears throat> but I want these curses out of my life. Can I go to the next one? Okay. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Are y'all going to give me plenty of time or do I have to hurry? Okay. You're already missing the first half of the game. Just embrace it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Proverbs 26, 2. Like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow. Talking about birds lighting. A light means to, to sit upon. When they come out of the air and they light upon a branch or they light upon whatever. A curse without a cause cannot light. You have to have given something legal right to operate in your life. Curses are not arbitrarily, oh, I think I'll go get the Smiths. Pshh. There's something happening or something that has happened that gave that thing legal right and permission to invade your life. It cannot light without a cause. So you're sitting here and saying, why do we always come up on this problem? And I mean, I had two young pastor and pastor's wife, young, beautiful. I mean, people you would want to make the face of your ministry in their 20s, telling me they're, they're beyond weary. I'm like, how can 26-year-old people be beyond weary? I don't even think I got tired the first time I was in my late 30s. And there's people burned out in their 20s? What is going on? What are they tired of? And we have the same problem and it's reoccurring and it comes around. And no matter how much we make, we can't ever get ahead. And no matter where we move, we've got the same problem. And no matter how many times we turn the calendar and how many gray hairs grow, we see the same scenery all the time. I'm telling you, there's something going on bigger than what you see. If that is your story or you relate to that in any way, there is something going on that is hidden in plain sight. You can't see it, but it is real and its desire is to overtake you. And you've got to find out what it is and break it. Can I go on to the next verse? Are y'all ready? Y'all with me? All right. Now, let's go to Numbers 22 and verse 6. <clears throat> Numbers 22 and verse 6. Now, this is a great scripture. 
Balak is the king of Moab. Israel is growing in strength and power because God is blessing them. They're now becoming so big and numerous that other countries are getting scared of them. So Balak says, I can't beat these guys myself. So he hires a sorcerer to come whose name is Balaam. Therefore, please come at once and curse this people, for they are too mighty. Perhaps I'll be able to defeat them. If you curse them, I can defeat them. I'll be able to drive them out of land, for I know whom you bless is blessed and whom you curse is cursed. Balaam goes and looks at the people and immediately sees the blessing of God. He comes back and reports to Balak. He said, I can't curse them. The king says, why? He said, because God has blessed them. And you cannot curse what God has blessed. See, there's something that happens when God begins to bless you. The blessing automatically wades off the curse because when you're walking under the blessing of God, come on somebody, the curse cannot get on your life because the blessing is a shield about you that will not let anything penetrate and touch your life. I'm telling you, if you release the blessing of God in your life, you're going to see things that used to could get you, they can't get you anymore. Things that used to paralyze you can't paralyze you anymore. Ah, things that used to make you fearful and afraid. They can't make you afraid anymore. Somebody shout amen. <laughs> I got to keep going. Keep rolling with me. Keep rolling. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the nature of a curse is it weakens you. 26 years old, I'm beyond weary. 30 years old, burnout. Been in ministry four years. I want to quit. Just started the company. This is too hard. And you thought it was just natural. Something else might be going on there. A curse weakens you. I want you to curse them to take away their strength so that I can overcome them. So the nature of a curse is to make you weak. Let me go on here. Now. <clears throat> me. Second Samuel 21, 1 through 3, and I'll stop right here. Now, there was a famine in the days of David. David was the king. Remember, David was the king after God's own heart. But he was Israel's second king, not the first. There was famine. We don't know famine. But famine is no rain, and it parches the land, and the cattle die, and there's no vegetation, and people die of hunger. This famine has gone on for three years, year after year, and finally, David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered and said, it's because of Saul. It's not because of anything you did, but the guy before you. Oh. And his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not children of Israel, but the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them. But Saul sought to kill them. In other words, they had made a covenant with this nation to protect them, and Saul slew them all. So while they thought Israel was their protector, Israel was their enemy and destroyed them. And he said, there's no rain. There's no vegetation. There's no blessing upon the land. David says, why? Not because of what you did, but because of your kingly lineage. The guy before you broke his word. He broke his covenant, and now you are dealing with a curse that has come upon the land because of broken covenant. Can I talk to you a minute about some of my, can I just get vulnerable to you a minute and talk to you about some of my own stuff? <laughs> Let me show you what I'm talking about. <laughs> my oldest son, I've touched on his testimony. I don't know if I'll ever tell it. I told his testimony. It's on YouTube. It's the most watched YouTube I've ever had in history, several million views was the day after I dropped my son off at a court-imposed rehab where the judge looked at him and said, if you cross the state line, I'll lock you up in prison for a year. 
So when everybody else's kid in August was going to college or starting their career or getting married to something else, I was dropping mine off at rehab. And it was one of the darkest days of my life, but up till then, it was it needed to help my son because my son was at death's door. When my son got on drugs, it was the most dark, most awful thing. I had a very peaceful house, very peaceful. <clears throat> and then that drug addiction gripped my son and it became chaos. I mean, unleashed holy hell chaos in our house. I mean, fight, I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a fighting guy. And me and my son locked up out in the front yard with Hope crying at the door. And I'm trying to keep, because he's punching holes in my walls and shoving his head through the TV. I'm talking about watching him go naked, climb up, jump out of my car going 40 miles an hour, roll through the ditch, get up naked and climb up a 20-foot high iron fence and go running through a high-end neighborhood and I have to climb the fence and go chase him down and hold him because he's hallucinating. I'm talking about walking him in two different times myself when he was unconscious with foam running out of his mouth into the emergency room OD'd asking the doctors, is he still alive? I'm and it's always happened on Saturday night, right before I preach on Sunday morning, every time. Totaled seven cars. I didn't say he wrecked seven cars. I said he totaled, flipped, wrapped them around trees, every, cars. All the, it was absolute cash, stealing money. We'd find we find thousands of dollars in shoeboxes, dealing drugs, everything else. People coming, making threats against our home, calling in threat because he owed drug dealers money. It was chaos. And I looked at that thing and said, oh, I didn't sow for that. I'm just going to be honest. I was a good daddy. I never missed a ball game. I never missed a practice. I was the only daddy sitting on the hill watching practice. I told my kids to pray. I had devotion with them every night. We listened to Christian music and watched Christian videos and learned Bible stories. Come on, somebody. They saw me lay hands on them when they had a fever and that fever would break. I was a good daddy. What in the world has happened in my house? And I didn't understand. How could this get in my house? I could understand if I was absent, if I was some reprobate or something like that, how it could happen. But I was a good dad. Oversight, curfew. I had it. And something had come in my house. So finally, it had disrupted my family and depleted me to the place where I called my pastor. I called Bishop Jakes. And I said, I just need to talk to somebody because the problem is, who do we talk to? <laughs> I couldn't take no more. Everything in my life had been turned upside down. Outside of the hurt of just seeing this happening to your child. And so I called Bishop Jakes. I said, just meet me somewhere. Have lunch back in the back room. I said, I just need to talk. I just need to talk. He said, he agreed. So he got a restaurant, a little back room and two chairs and a table. And he and I went back there with him and I bawled and I squalled and I bawled and I squalled. And I'd sit there and I snotted and bawled and squalled. My heart's broken and I'm pouring out my heart. And he's sitting there like this. <laughs> Big old wise. I didn't understand that. He didn't move. He showed no emotion. So I went on and on. I probably did this for an hour. He, was sitting there. he finally said, are you through? <laughs> See, most people say they'd like a spiritual father. Most people can't handle a spiritual father. A spiritual father is not your buddy. A spiritual father yanks your chain and holds you to your character. They're not your friend. They're your guide. So he sits there unmoved by everything I'm saying and looks at me and says, are you through? Well, I wasn't appreciating that. I'm just going to be honest with you. Because <laughs> I'm hurting. And he looked at me and said, your son is so sick of you. <laughs> he said, and this is a quote. He said, he's so tired of being a pawn in your play. Said he used some other choice, rather choice words. He's so tired of being a pawn in your play. He said, because we had a huge campus, seven, uh, excuse me, seven different buildings, quarter of a million square feet, 22 acres of land. He said, your son drives up on that campus every week and says, what can I ever do to impress my daddy? He says, all you've shown him is your victories and you've hid your defeats. 
So therefore, he looks at you and you are not real. He said he sees his flaws. He sees his difficulty. He sees his struggle. But you have hidden all of yours from him. So you are a goal that cannot be attained. And he might as well not even try anyway because you are not real. You are a fictional character to him. And he says, if your son is ever going to be one and you're going to save his life, you're going to have to go back home and find him. You're going to have to get him and take him off and tell him every nasty thing, every carnal thing, every time you got beat, every time you defeated, everything you struggle with, the thoughts that run through your mind, everything you never wanted him to find out. He said, that's the way you're going to turn him around. I flew back home. I got in my truck and my son was living on the street and I started riding through the streets where I thought he might be and I found him and asked him to get in my truck. I took him to an abandoned parking lot and I parked it and I sat there and I began to tell him how awful his daddy was and every mistake his daddy had made and every regret that I had and every flaw in my character and every struggle that I won't nobody know about and he sat there and he burst into tears and me and my son sat in that parking lot and we wept for hours why? Because we only want to show people the good stuff. And we never want to confront the bad stuff. But the good stuff is not what's killing you. It's the bad stuff we refuse to talk about and hide from everybody. And Bishop helped me understand. He said, your son does not relate to your victory. He only relates to your pain and you've made him think you have none. And that night was the beginning of my son's 180 coming out of the throes of addiction to drugs. And right now my son is not on the street and he's not wrecking cars. He is a husband to a wife. He is a father to three kids. He has a house with a fenced in backyard. He has a great job. His wife owns her own business. Come on somebody. There is a God in heaven that will reveal the reason for the curse. And when you break it, the blessing comes. Somebody turn to three people and say, I want the blessing. Come on. I want the blessing. I want the blessing. I want the blessing. I know what time it is. Can I have five more minutes? I had to make it right to release my son from that curse. I've struggled because all of our ministries since COVID have been nowhere near their giving potential. It's frustrating to know where we could be and what we could do, but I no matter what I did, it just felt like it was held back. And I'm like, well, I'm a tither and I'm an extravagant giver. I give to everybody. I bless people all the time. I bless people who don't even deserve to be blessed. I buy $10 meals and leave $100 tips. And I, I, God, what's wrong? Be careful when you ask him. Tell you what he showed me. This was three weeks ago. Took me back to 2016. I have a sports subscription that is a paid sports subscription to my favorite team. $9.95. And during a game, I could not get my app to work. So my friend said, here, for right now, just use my password and you can log in on my account. Lord said, pull that up and go check that. And it was 2022 and I'm still logged in on his account. He says, you're robbing them. He said, and as long as you're taking from them, I got to take from you. He said, you owe them $600. Wow. Wow. It wasn't even, it wasn't nowhere on my radar. But he didn't say casual, he said, if you diligently, careful, diligent and careful to do the right thing, then all these blessings shall come. But if you're not diligent and if you're not careful, if you just ignore it and it don't matter, 
then these curses shall come upon you, shall pursue you, and shall overtake you. I got in touch with that company. I got my secretary to renew my account in my name. Called this company and told them I sent them a check for $600 to make it right. This was last week and last Sunday was the second highest giving week we've had in two years. I did this last Thursday and you gave last Sunday on a huge level. <laughs> a few months ago, I was riding down the road and I told my wife, I said, I said, I feel cynicism trying to get on me. It's hard to be a man of faith and be cynical. And she said, why? I said, because nobody keeps their word anymore. I'm a very principled guy. Man, I'm extremely principled. On the Enneagram thing, I'm a, I'm a one time 10. I believe in doing things right. And I mean, hurt after hurt, betrayal after betrayal, lawsuit after lawsuit, just pursuing me, overtaking me, depleting me, distracting me. And it's like it never quits. And I asked God, I said, what in the world? And I done got used to it now. When he said, yes, what? He shows you. He said, you remember? And he called his name. And as a young boy in Atlanta, starting a church. And she said, you was running out of a building in a conference. And he stopped and asked you, would you mentor him? Well, I have a fellowship. I have ways to be mentored. I, it's, I can't do it randomly. But I was hurrying up trying to get out the door. I had a plane to catch. I just got through speaking. And this, this young boy starry-eyed, looked at me, and would, would, you, would you mentor me? I need help. And he's got a little startup church in Atlanta. And I just right quick gave him my number. And I looked through my phone, and there had been a couple of times he had reached out to me, and I never responded. And I saw on Instagram where his church was floundering. And the Lord said, I don't care if he was in a hurry. You told him he was going to help him. I called that boy. I told him to come to our conference last week. I made him a VIP, and I treated him like he was the Pope. Why? I broke covenant with him. I gave him my word, and I didn't do it. And when I made it right, all this crap happening to me stopped. Play something if you would, Terrence. I know some of you have a limit how long you want to stay at church. And I want you to know something. I'm not offended by that, and you're welcome to go and come as you please. But I can't preach like this and then say, all right, y'all go have a good Sunday. <clears throat> because I've seen people wiping tears, and I've seen people contemplating and some of the stories I'm telling you have opened you up and they're hitting home. And there's people, if not everybody, the most significant majority of you have something in your life you're fighting and you're not sure what and you're not even sure why and it just continues to be consistent in your life. There are things that are random events that can happen and cause you difficulty. But as Deuteronomy 28 tells us, the vast majority of life is choice driven. Because when you get to the end of the chapter, you know what he says? He says, choose blessings or cursings. He said, I've told you what's operating. You get to choose which one you want. I've told you how blessing can chase you. I've told you how cursing can shake you. But I will not make the choice for you. The choice is yours. And I just had to come to the realization some things that I just winked at or maybe I hadn't thought about were costing me, costing me big. Because just because it's all right to you don't mean it's all right with God. And so what I want to do right now is if the praise team will come back out, usually to get an altar call like this to start, I have to be vulnerable myself and tell some of my mess. And then usually when four or five people pop up, then two or 300 will pop up. This is not a laying on hands altar call. 
This curse came from disobedience and it is changed by obeying. I can't lay hands on you and break that. This thing is up to you. That thing with the money, that thing with me getting cynical, there was nothing any of y'all could do about that. I had to confront that. But if in any way whatsoever, you know, you know that there is something that you're swinging at that's trying to take you out. It's weakened you, it's wore you down, it's depleted you, or you're seeing the same scenery and no matter where you go, what you do, where you move or who you meet, you keep seeing the same stuff. There's something there you need to confront and deal with. And I'm gonna give you a few minutes before we release those who wanna go home. There's some people that say, I cannot leave this building till I have dealt with this and brought freedom to my life. If that's you without hesitation, I want you to get up all over this building and come down here and find you a place at this altar. You can kneel, you can lay, you can do whatever you wanna do, but I want you to come down here and find you a place.